Hello and welcome to our penultimate lecture on Toni Morrison's Beloved. This lecture um, is meant to do some close reading practice of passages from the novel um, so you have a better understanding of what literary scholars do when they're analyzing literature and <clears throat> when you come to a text like Toni Morrison's Beloved you're really richly rewarded because of her skill as an author um, but it also should uh, bear repeating that this is this is not easy material it's not an easy book but also the subject matter is as serious as it comes and in the context of our course on the Gothic, <coughs> you can see how in her hands um, and in the setting she's chosen, which is enslavement, American slavery, and its aftermath, um, it's not just a ghost story, it's also an indictment of American history. So a lot of the themes we've seen all along from supernatural events, ghosts, and so forth, um, to haunted houses, to oppressive, um, domineering male figures, this all takes on a whole, wholly different uh, set of meanings in the historical context of American slavery. So just to review, I don't know why it looks like that. Close reading. So this is a, a phrase you hear a lot in English classes and it's also something that works well when you're doing any kind of reading that you're struggling with or any anything that's well written like poetry. You can. This is what we did with the poems earlier this semester. Close reading is Analyze something you read by looking closely at the details of its language, its patterns, look for its ironies, surprises, literary effects, figurative language, you know, metaphor, simile, personification, imagery. And why do we do this? Well, we perform a close reading of texts. I'm going to just do a close reading of texts to see how language can subvert, enhance, entertain, surprise, challenge, or change the expected meaning of something. Okay, so authors, remember, we're always like, why don't they just say it directly? Well, because language can add power. The way you use the language can add power to your meaning. Um, what is our goal as literary uh, detectives? We're here to answer, how does the language help to create the meaning? This book would not be so powerful if it didn't have all these effects. Um, and there's a high stake here, which is that Toni Morrison is getting us to understand history in a way you can't just by reading timelines and facts. We're getting interior monologues from people who are enslaved. These are people whose voices are historically erased. Um, they weren't allowed to learn to read or write. And so we don't have a lot of first person narratives of enslaved people, but a book like Toni, Morrison, Toni Morrison's, which is based on a true story, gives us a rare glimpse into that. And it's, it's her imaginative style that helps convey that meaning. Okay, so, and, sh and this is on purpose. You know, a lot of students are like, oh, they'll be like, oh, did the author really do that? Are we over interpreting? Well, the author really did do this on purpose. I mean, she tells us in the foreword, and her goal is to create, through language, this sense of disorientation in the novel, to make you feel lost. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have had this experience reading it. It's very difficult. And that's no accident. She writes, quote, there would be no lobby into this house. There would be no introduction into it or into the novel. I wanted the reader to be kidnapped, thrown ruthlessly into an alien environment as the first step into a shared experience with the book's population, just as the characters were snatched from one place to another, from any place to any other, without preparation or defense. So 
in highlighting this, she, I wanted the reader to, to be kidnapped. And these phrases, to be kidnapped, thrown ruthlessly. That means like without caring how you feel. And put into an alien environment, someplace totally foreign. I mean, imagine, you know, you, you don't know where you are. No one tells you. You're around no one you know. You have no choice. That's what she's trying to convey through her language. And I just keep these phrases here. Be kidnapped, thrown ruthlessly, alien environment. Why? Why does the author want to make the reader feel this way? Well, the purpose is to create what she calls a shared experience. You, the reader, are sharing an experience with her characters. And there's high stakes. She's telling us this. The characters are snatched from one place to another, from any place to any other without preparation or defense. This is enslavement and its legacy. This is what happened to people. And you know, the effects are still with us today. And um, the, the founding fathers who get trumpeted about on television all the time, especially given the political uproar right now. Um, you know, when we talk about this, and we'll, I'll do this in the next lecture, you have to remember that uh, a large percentage of these people who wrote the documents that govern our country were people who owned slaves. So the laws that govern us today are very much soaked in this. So for us to have a sense of this shared experience is one that's very important. And Toni Morrison brings us that. So again, we're, we're analyzing things by looking at them closely. That's why it's called close reading. It doesn't mean putting your face on the paper. It means you're looking for patterns, ironies, surprises, literary effects, figurative language. Okay, so uh, we'll get right into it. Um, there's this recurring uh, theme, I guess you could say, or this rec recurring mention of this thing called the bit. And this is um, one of those things that once you learn more about it, you start to see how horrendous it is and how this sort of, this becomes a, a big motif in this book because it's so horrific and it really, it captures the violence of enslavement. So my show here is a picture. So this idea of a bit, a bit, it's like the word bite. And if you've ridden a horse, or you've seen a horse, you see they, they wear a bit. Here's a picture of a horse mouth. And what, <clears throat> what it does it connects to the reins so that when you're riding on a horse, you can pull it and it, it, it'll make the horse stop because it's very uncomfortable. It's a big piece of metal stick in the horse's mouth. Um, people would, in, during American slavery, this was an instrument of torture used very frequently with slaves on, on farms and in work environments as punishment, as control. And so this would be put into a person's mouth for a number of days, hours, and it, you can't eat, you can't talk, and it, it causes physical damage. So now in the novel, the last time Seth had seen Paul D, you might remember, um, it was the day of their escape, and they were all supposed to meet in the corn and run off, follow the um, Underground Railroad. And Paul D had gotten in trouble and was put into a bit. And a, a bigger device also that had like spikes that prevent him from lying down. So she's um, talking to Paul D now. They're, this is a flashback. They're talking about their escape from Sweet Home. Now they're in the present. They're living together at 124 Bluestone. And she says to him, people I saw as a child, she said, who'd had the bit always looked wild after that. Whatever they used it on them for, it couldn't have worked because it put a wildness where before there wasn't any. When I look at you, I don't see it. There ain't no wildness in your eye nowhere. Okay, so she's saying it, it didn't seem to have the same effect on him or he's recovered. Who knows, you know? Just to, like, look at this a little bit. This is this is an implement that caused the further dehumanization of an enslaved person. And just this word dehumanization is really important. D is taking away hu the human part of you, and it's a process. And 
This is an image from the early 19th century, the early 1800s, um, showing how a, a device could be used a bit. Um, you pull on both sides. Now, um, a company in England was making these, and at the beginning of the 1800s, they w were shocked because there was like an increased demand in these devices coming from the United States. And that was because it was becoming very popular as a form of control on the plantations. Um, so remember the events of this book take place in the second half of the 19th century. And these were well, well known, well documented implements. So let's, let's talk about sort of doing a close reading. One thing I noticed actually it happened one time when I was reading this aloud in class. And I was reading this particular passage, and, and I noticed something while I was reading. You can see here I circled it. There's a large number of words in this particular passage that start with W. And as I was reading, I was like, oh, that's weird. You know, and that's a term we use called alliteration when you start words with the same letter. And poets use it, writers use it, and... and and then this, like, look at this line. There's, it's like four times one line. I was reading this. And I was like, people I saw as a child. She said, who'd had the bit always? Oh, there's a W. Always looked wild after that. Whatever they used it on, them for it couldn't have worked because it put a wildness where, before there wasn't any. When I look at you, I don't see it. There ain't no wildness in your eye. No where. So she say those. So those say those words. Wildness where. Notice what your mouth is actually doing. Say the W, it's like whoa, whoa, whoa. Your mouth has to go closed to like an O, o shape almost. And then, and then I was thinking about as I was reading this. This is a passage about wearing a bit, and that if you spread your mouth open, imagine you have a bit. Oh, oh, that's like a letter you cannot say. And what's happening in this passage, even if you don't realize it, you're, when you're physically articulating it, you're doing something that someone who wears a bit can't do. And again, this goes to this dehumanization. It's a reminder, as Seth is talking, it's a reminder of the human things that she can still do because there's no bit in her mouth. And, you know, Susan's like, ah, oh, this is like is Morrison doing this on purpose. And look, you know, she's passed away. You can't really ask her. But this is happening in the text in a passage about a bit. And the, the passage itself is reminding us as a reader what we can do with our mouths that literally was impossible to someone whose mouth had been ruined by this. So we're enacting a freedom in reading this that someone in a bit can't enact. And it's a very simple, small, you know, almost unnoticeable thing. But noticing it, the physicality of that can bring to mind the physicality of you know, the torture device that's being described. And this is a good example of the text doing exactly what it means to do. This is, this is like we're getting meaning out of the way it's written beyond just the direct communication of the words. I mean, it's just like, this is the kind of thing you notice when you're reading Morrison and it just blows your mind. Because you're like, wow, this is, this is an artist operating on so many levels. Um, <clears throat> here's a longer passage taken from later in the book. <clears throat> and, you know, this, this is a, based on a true story, like I've said. Um, and one of the things that is the most horrific thing of the book is that Margaret Garner, on whom this is based, killed her, she was, she, she wanted to kill all four of her children rather than let them be taken back into enslavement. And so Seth, Setha has killed her second youngest child, you know, and the book is basically about that child supposedly coming back from the dead as a ghost. Um, this ghost comes back, this woman named Beloved, who has a, a, a scar on her chin, and is the same age that that dead child would have been. And um, 
so this, you know, this event, the event where Seth had killed her child and was going to kill Denver and the other two, the two sons, it just, it haunts, it haunts the, in the house, it haunts her, it haunts her whole family. Um, the tragedy of it eventually killed baby Suggs. So here she is talking to Beloved about why she killed her. And as, you know, this is part of the disorienta in dis disorientation of this novel. You don't always know who's talking. There aren't quotation marks to guide you. Um, we go in and out of a character's point of view. We get different characters' perspectives. And that, again, that's part of the disorientation. It's part of the kidnapping effect that Morrison wants us to feel as readers. It's frustrating, okay? Well, it's like a luxurious frustration compared to what people she's depicting went through. So she's talking to Beloved. She says, my love was too thick. And remember, that's what Paul D. tells her what, before he leaves her. So here we are later in the novel, by the way. Paul D. has left her because he found out from Stamp Paid why everyone avoids Seth. He found out the thing that he didn't know. Everyone else knows. That she killed her daughter. And he told her, this is an accusation. My love, your love is too thick. So she says to Beloved, my love was too thick. What would he know about that? Who in the world is he willing to die for? Would he give his privates to a stranger in return for a carving? Remember, that's from the beginning. She has sex with the stone carver so she can get Beloved carved into the gravestone. Would he do that? Some other way, he said. There must have been another, some other way. So here, here she's like, here we are in the novel. She's talking, she's quoting him. There must have been some other way. So she's like imagining what he would say. Let school teacher haul us away, I guess, to measure your behind before he tore it up. So there's a whole scene where school teacher uses measuring tape to, you know, he's taking measurements of all the slaves. He, he treats them like animals. And that also connects with Paul, what Paul D. says when he leaves her saying, you, you have four, four legs, not two, Seth. And, and this ties into this idea that, you know, the slaves are animals. That's how school teacher treats them. It's part of the process of dehumanization. He's let, she, so she's like, what, am I supposed to let school teacher haul us away, I guess, to measure your behind before he tore it up? I have felt what it felt like. And nobody walking or stretched out so no one living or dead, is going to make you feel it too. She's just like, no way will I let my children be measured like animals. Not you, not none of mine. And when I tell you you mine, I also mean I'm yours. I wouldn't draw breath without my children. I told baby Suggs that she got down, I, t I told baby Suggs that she got down on her knees to beg God's pardon for me. Okay, there's another flashback, like right after she killed Beloved, Baby Suggs comes in the little hut and starts begging God's pardon. Still, it is, it's so. My plan was to take us all to the other side where my own ma'am is. She's like, I was going to kill us all to and take us to where my own mother is. They stopped me from getting us there, but they didn't stop you from getting there. Ha ha. You came right back like a good girl, like a daughter, which is what I wanted to be and would have been if my ma'am had been able to get out of the rice long enough before they hanged her and let me be one. So here, this is a flashback to her own childhood. This is like flashback in a flashback. Her, she never really got to know her mother. Her mother was working, and then her mother got hung um, in front of her. She doesn't know why, so I'll keep going. You know what? She had the bit so many times she smiled. Okay, this is back to the bit. When she wasn't smiling, she smiled, and I never saw her own smile. So this is like, she wore the bit so many times that it messed up her face to a permanent smile. I wonder what they was doing when they was caught. She's talking about her mother. She's so, so now we're like in her head, right? She's talking about Paul. She's talking about getting measured. She's talking about why she killed her child. She's talking about her mother wearing the bit. And then she's talking about when her mom got killed, there's a whole group of them that they hung. It's like a grisly scene. So she goes, I wonder what they was doing when they was caught. Running, you think? No, not that. So keep in mind here, also, this goes back to what Morrison said. Like, she didn't know what was going on. She doesn't even know why all these people were killed right in front of her on that plantation. This is before she went to Sweet Home. 
So she's like, I wonder what they was doing when they was caught running, you think? No, not that, because she was my ma'am, and nobody's ma'am would run off and leave her daughter, would she? Would she now? Leave her in a yard with a one-armed woman? Even if she hadn't been able to suckle the daughter for, her da daughter for more than a week or two and had to turn her over to another woman's tit that never had enough for all. They said it was the bit that made her smile. So, okay. Even if she wouldn't... So, when she, she, her mother gave her birth to her, Seth, and then she's forced to work. So, Seth was, like, put in, in the care of this woman who took care of all the babies and nursed all of them. She only had one arm, so that's what she was made to do. Um, and then back to the bit. It, they said it was the bit that made her smile when she didn't want to. Like this, and then, so, again, back to the bit. And then here's another reference. Like the Saturday girls working the slaughterhouse yard. This is in reference to Cincinnati, where she lives now. So on Saturdays, when the slaughterhouse is closed, a bunch of girls go to the slaughterhouse yard and, you know, prostitute themselves. And this, this idea of the Saturday girls comes up a lot. Like the Saturday girls working the slaughterhouse yard. When I came out of jail, I saw them plain, working in a pig yard. That has got to be something for a woman to do. I got close to myself when I got out of jail and bought, so to speak, your name. Okay, so that's also a reference to when she paid for the gravestone by having sex with the carver. But the Bodwins got me the cooking job at Sawyer's and let me be able to smile on my own like now when I think about you. And the Bodwins, those are the white people, abolitionists, um, the white people who helped slaves cross the river, the stamp paid. And they come up a lot later in the book. And they think of themselves as very good people and like that's a topic that we'll, I'll look, touch on in the next lecture, but you know, they're quote unquote good white people. They got her the job and, and that enabled her to smile on her own. Um, so this, this, a passage like this has a lot of material for close reading. So I, here's some little annotations I've made, but it, and it's, it's very, it's very dense because there's so many flashbacks. There's so many references being made, you know, it's a, it's a monologue. Seth is talking to beloved. There's no um, quotation marks. She's quoting other people. She's she's quoting Paul here. She's talking about baby Suggs. She's talking about her childhood. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, there's there's so many time frames being referenced here. So so here she I'm here I'm pointing out she's quoting Paul D's criticism of her. So she's re she's repeating it and then she's like taking it apart. Who in the world is he willing to die for? Would he have done what I've done? Well, actually, you know, we know from having read his story that he has done a lot. He, he, uh, there's a whole bit where he's in, a, in Alfred, Georgia. Then he lives in Delaware where he is kept by a woman. So, you know, a lot of the characters don't know what the other characters have gone through. But that's also part of the dis disorientation and dehumanization it's just people don't know each other's stories and they can't know um so here's flashback to having to pay for having to have for, for flashback to having sex to pay for beloved's tombstone here and then later so it happens twice um here's the reference to school teachers pseudo race studies on the slaves of sweet home and again that's also like this measuring um there's a part where he has his nephews or sons whoever they are it's, it's always like vague uh line up the characteristics like on one side they're human characteristics and they're animals on the other side and this was very offensive to seth part of the dehumanization just like wearing a bit you know it, it's like if you think of the slaves as animals somehow makes it easier to treat them poorly part of the logic of it um here this bit where she goes ha ha you know that's a very in the present articulation so that brings us right to the that's you know that's a very like human moment where she's like ha ha um she's not narrating a story she's kind of making fun of they stopped me from getting us there but that didn't stop you from getting here ha ha like as if beloved's defied 
the rules of life and death. Ha ha. It's kind of like a cool joke. You came right on back like a good girl, like a daughter. Um, and then here's the sentence. She had the bit so many times she smiled. When she wasn't smiling, she smiled. And I never saw her own smile. And then this last part, smile on my own, like now when I think about you. You know, there's this constant repetition. That's one of the things we look for in close reading. It's repetition. Um, she repeats smile four times. And it's jarring because, you know, smile is like something you do with your mouth when you're happy, right? But we know in this case, it's, it's kind of a joke to call it a smile. It's really like your face has been tortured open. So that's jarring because we know it's not about happiness. It's a, she had the bit so many times she smiled. You could hear that and be like, she was happy. She had the bit so many times she smiled. But then you realize it's a reference to like the physical deformity caused by the bit. And then you think about Seth as a child looking at her mother smiling and knowing that she wasn't smiling because she was happy. It's, it, you know, it's like the one physical sign of happiness that we can read on another person's face is actually a lie and then down here we've got in this whole passage we've got Seth trying to make sense of the family separation being snatched from the family being kidnapped that's what Morrison talks about at the beginning this idea that families are separated torn from one another you know just because you're born to someone doesn't mean you get to be with them um, and Seth's trying to make sense of this now because it's after slavery she's living with her two daughters and you know on sweet home she wasn't separated immediately they let her live with her children it was a smaller farm and the garners were quote unquote you know good slave owners which is again a problematic thing um which we'll talk about but in this case she the place where she was born um she didn't get to be a daughter and, and now she's trying to figure out what that means like she was my mam and nobody's mam would run off and leave her daughter would she would she now um leave her in the yard you know it's it's like this doesn't make sense this idea of splitting families apart doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to the child it doesn't make sense to her as a as a mother it's it goes against everything instinctual and natural and um the return of beloved this ghost or i mean is she we don't really even know and it's sort of thrown into question by the end um it, it sort of confirms seth's idea that like a child would, can't leave its mother um and then we've got here a flashback to the sight of the woman women forced to sell themselves this idea of the saturday working girls keeps coming up for seth and also it gets connected with her and the getting the gravestone marker carved with beloved on it. And it it's this idea that that's one thing a woman has to do um, is, is have sex um, for things. In, in they're so-called free people now. They're in Ohio, it's after the Civil War. But look, the women still have to have sex to make a living. And she had to have sex to carve her baby's name in the tombstone um it's part of the economics of the aftermath of slavery and then here at the end oops um the bodwins got me the cooking job at sawyer's and left me able to smile on my own like now when i think about you so this is a flashback to getting the job through the bodwins and that's what prevented her from having to become a prostitute and this phrase, the ability to smile on my own, this is devastating, I think, because it, it, it's, it's pointing to the fact she has the agency. She's able to smile when she's happy. I mean, this is so, so small and insignificant, something we would take for granted. But for her, her mother smiled because she had been tortured. So being able to connect your smile to happiness is minor but it's an act of freedom that she knows is an act of freedom um that brings us to the present and so again this this passage has so many things so many flashbacks so much evocative imagery so many recurring ideas um and and it's also about the dehumanization the physical degradation of slavery the separation, the kidnapping, as, as what was the phrase from, to be kidnapped, 
thrown ruthlessly, put into an alien environment. And we're getting that shared experience in passages like this because we're being thrown around through time. We don't always know who's talking. And these are characters who are snatched from one place to another. And think about it and then add to that the fact that they're children being snatched and torn from their parents um, without any preparation or defense. Okay. Um, here's another example where we've got, this is what makes this book so complicated. It's like being snatched around and kidnapped. We've got flashbacks in flashbacks. Um, so this passage is describing the party baby Suggs threw the day before school teacher and the slave catchers arrived at 124 Bluestone. So we're flashback from the present of the book to that, that day of the party. Remember Stamp Paid, who is the, um, he's the guy who takes people across the Ohio River in the boat. He, he found these blueberries, or blackberries, rather. And blackberries are grown on bushes that have spikes and thorns. And he, he brought a bunch to baby Suggs, and she was so excited. She made some pies and invited people over, and it just seemed like a miraculous event. And then it was the next day that school teacher and the slave catchers arrived, and that's when Seth took her children into the woodshed and started killing them. And the question sort of lingering about this episode is like, why did no one warn them? And it comes out that people had fun at this party, but then they were also like offended by how excessive it was, and they felt like it was a sign of arrogance on Baby Suggs' part. And Baby Suggs, remember, she had been on Sweet Home, the plantation. Her son, she had she had, had eight children, one of whom was Hallie. Hallie was special. He was, everyone loved him. He was kind. He was smart. He could read. And then he he bought her freedom. He worked extra on other plantations to pay for his mother's freedom and the reason he did that was because she was in so much pain she could hardly walk and the reason she was in so much pain was because in previous plantations she had been hurt um treated poorly she had you know lost all of her children one by one and she had had as as it's called later in the book an unlivable life and so he he did what he could to free her and then um, but people like I said another thing about this book is people don't know all the stories about each other it's hard you can't know everyone's story especially if you're snatched and thrown around and people don't also don't want to talk about all these things because it's so bad so it's a little background so here this is the quote starting on page 161 from Denver's two thrilled eyes it grew to a feast for 90 people 124 that's the address 124 shook with their voices far into the night Ninety people who ate so well and ate and laughed so much, it made them angry. Now, to take two buckets of blackberries and make ten, maybe twelve pies, to have turkey enough for the whole town pretty near, it made them mad. Loaves and fishes were his powers. Now, this is an allusion, with an A, uh, allusion, reference to, you know, one of the miracles of Jesus in the, in the New Testament is that he makes water into wine. And he's able to feed a huge crowd. And this is referring to that. It's almost like Baby Suggs did something magical that should have only been reserved for, like, the Son of God. Okay, so, and, and as I read this, you know, it's, it's, it's a general narration of what happened. But who's speaking here? You know, it's not, in, it's not, it's not like Denver's telling the story. It's not like Baby Suggs is alive and telling the story. It's just the narrator, but... Whose voice are we hearing in this passage? So now to take two buckets of blackberries and make 10, maybe 12 pies, to have turkey enough for the whole town pretty near? Doesn't that sound like someone's talking? It made him mad. Loaves and fishes were his powers. The tone here is like angry. They did not belong to an ex-slave who had probably never carried 100 pounds to scale or picked okra with a baby on her back, who had never been lashed by a 10-year-old white boy as God knows they had. So, like, when you hear that, who had never been lashed by a 10-year-old white boy? Like, we don't know what that's referring to, but that sounds awfully specific, right? That's like the generalized voice of, an, of a resentful person who had attended the, 
party and was like, she'd never been lashed by a 10 year old like I was. Or she never carried 100 pounds. Or she never picked okra with a baby on her back. Well, in fact, you know, baby sucks went through that and worse. But this person talking doesn't know it. But also, we don't even know who's talking. So, this is like a technique, a literary technique, which you don't need to memorize or anything, but it's called free and direct discourse. And it's when, like, a narration picks up the voice of a character or a person. And you just know that because of the tone. Um, but what we're getting here is, like, the generalized perspective of, like, the resentful people who the next day did not warn her that the slave catcher had come to town, right? So they're, like, angry at baby sucks, who had never been lashed by a 10-year-old white boy, as God knows they had, who had not even escaped slavery, had, in fact, been bought out of it by a doting son and driven to the Ohio River in a wagon. Okay, so this is, like, real resentment here. You can feel the resentment. Like, she hadn't even escaped. She'd been bought out. Like, she's some kind of lucky person. Okay, so this is like a flashback. This idea of, like, picking okra with a baby on your back. That's someone's flashback. Within the flashback about the party. Lashed by a 10-year-old white boy. That's a flashback within a flashback. You feel how disorienting this is? And it's confusing. It's making us confused, and that's on purpose. All right. Here's some more descriptions. Baby, baby Sug, flashbacks in flashbacks with a hypothetical situation is proposed. So this is just, I'm showing you this because it's, a, it's, it's showing you how complicated this book is, right? How, how deep the narration is, how, how this narration style is making us experience what the characters experience, which is feeling kidnapped, feeling snatched, feeling confused. Okay, quote. Her hip hurt every single day, but she never spoke of it. So we're talking about baby sub. Only Hallie, who had watched her movements closely for the last four years, knew that to get in and out of bed, she had to lift her thigh with both hands, which was why he spoke to Mr. Garner. Okay, so by the way, you hear, this is Hallie's point of view. So we're getting Hallie's perspective. I mean, we never meet Hallie directly in this book, right? But... In this brief part of the narration, we're getting Hallie's perspective. So he, he, only he knew. As he walks her, so this is why, this is why he spoke to Mr. Garner about buying her out of there. So she could sit down for a change. So she could sit down for a change. That sounds like Hallie talking. So she could sit down for a change. Sweet boy. Okay. So who's saying sweet boy there? That sounds like something her son, her, his mother would say. So we've, we've switched in two sentences from like Hallie's perspective to, Baby sucks. Sweet boy. That's like what a mother would say, right? Okay, so this is page 165, by the way. Sad as it was that she did not know where her children were buried or what they looked like alive, fact was she knew more about them than she knew about herself, having never had the map to discover what she was like. So here's a part where we're getting like the interiority, the inner feelings of baby sucks. Okay. And, and and the things she doesn't know about herself because her whole, like, she, her name is Baby, but she doesn't really even, it's because her, her, like, husband at the last place she lived would call her Baby, right? Which we know it's like calling someone honey or dear. It's like, that's not your name, but that that's her, the only name she knows. It's like she doesn't even have identity in the way that we think of identity, all right? And then here's all these things she doesn't know about herself. Could she sing? Was she pretty? Was she a good friend? Could she have been a loving mother, a faithful wife? Have I got a sister and does she favor me? Do you even see that? So these are questions about her and then it becomes her voice here. Have I got a sister and does she favor me? Does she like me? If my mother knew me, would she like me? So we've suddenly switched to baby Sug's point of view within a sentence there. These are all questions like you can't answer if you don't have any orientation to a family you can't look in a mirror. You don't know what your own name is, where you're from. She doesn't even know if she's pretty. Can she sing? I mean, her body is like ravaged, so she can't even know what her body would be like without damage. She, she never got the chance to be a loving mother. She couldn't be a faithful wife. So, again, we've got flashback in a flashback. We've got shifting narrators. It's very confusing. Um, I've got three more slides here. So this is, again, another narrative trick happening. 
Seth is n- describing her time in prison, but she's saying it as if she no longer has to describe it. So after Seth kills her daughter, she's sent to prison. There's a big court case. And so now in the present of the book, Beloved's there, right? Living with her mother. And they've convinced, everyone's convinced now that Beloved is, in fact, the dead baby returned to life, right? So her presence makes Seth, quote, excited to giddiness by the things she no longer had to remember. And then this is the passage on 216 about all the things she no longer has to remember. But by narrating this, we're learning what she remembers, which is very ironic. It's like, these are the, this is Seth not describing her time in prison, but she's describing it. So it's ironic. Um, And again, disorienting. Quote, I don't have to remember nothing. I don't have to even, I don't even have to explain. She understands it all. So this is beloved. She, like, this is Seth talking, like, I don't have to say anything because Beloved understands. I can forget how Baby Sug's heart collapsed, how we agreed it was consumption without a sign of it in the world, so she can forget about Baby Sug's death, which she knows was caused by sadness. Her eyes, when she brought my food, I can forget that, how she told me that Howard and Bugler were all right, but wouldn't let go of each other's hands, played that way. So this is... Now we're like in prison with Seth and like Baby Shug's bringing her news and food. And she's like, oh, your kids are okay. They just, they're kind of weird. They won't stop holding hands, right? She handed me the food from a basket. Things wrapped small enough to get through the bars. That's how we know she's in prison, bars, whispering news. Mr. Bodwin, remember he's the quote unquote good white person. Mr. Bodwin going to see the judge. In chambers, she kept talking. She kept say, kept on saying in chambers, like I knew what it meant, or she did. The colored ladies of Delaware, Ohio, had drawn up a petition to keep me from being hanged. That two white preachers had come around and wanted to talk to me, pray for me. That a newspaper man came to. She told me news, and I told her I needed something for the rats. And she, she was in prison with Denver, actually. And the rats were there. So again, I just point this out because just in terms of analysis, like this whole passage starts by Seth's excited to giz- giddiness by the things she no longer had to remember. And then it's a list of memories. So it's like an, it's a jarring irony. Like I said, when we're close reading, we look for ironies. It's a, the opposite of what we expect. You know, she says she no longer has to remember. Then why is she remembering all this? Um, again, this is around that same po- point in the book, 216. Baby Shug says, they're going to let you out for the burial, she said. Um, and then so Seth goes to the funeral of the baby she killed. Uh, to the burial. No, she's not allowed to go to the funeral. Uh, Reverend Pike spoke in a real loud voice, but I didn't catch a word except the first two. And we know those first two are dearly beloved. And three months later, when Denver was ready for solid food and they let me out for good, I went and got you a gravestone, but I didn't have money enough for the carving, so I exchanged bartered you might say what I did have and I'm sorry to this day I never thought to ask him for the whole thing okay so here we are again talking about how she got beloved engraved on the tombstone right it's like comes up all the time all I heard of what Reverend Pike said is just the words dearly beloved which is what you are to me and I don't have to be sorry about getting one word and I don't have to remember the slaughterhouse and all the Saturday girls who worked his yard I can forget that what I did changed Baby Shug's life. No clearing, no company, just laundry and shoes. I can forget it all now because as soon as I got the gravestone in place, you made your presence known in the house and worried us all the distractions. So she's like, as soon as I got the gravestone, you know, you started haunting the house. I didn't understand it then. I thought you were mad with me. And now I know that you was. You ain't. If you was, you ain't now because you came back here to me. I was right all along. There's no world outside my door. I only need to know one thing. How bad is the scar? So this is, again, an internal character monologue. There's no, like, there's no dialogue marks here. It's just paragraphs. And, you know, we don't really even know. Is she really saying all this to Beloved? Is she not? We're just getting an internal monologue of Seth. Um... And just to, just to conclude, there's all sorts of narrative shifts happening, especially in the second half of the book. 
It's very disorienting. So in the first half, we get Paul D's perspective a lot. And then later, Stamp Paid narrates a bit. He talks about finding um, Seth in Denver. And he talks about what he did during the war. And then there's this bit here starting in 236. It's very confusing. First person narration from Seth's point of view, her own history from her perspective. It begins, beloved, she my daughter, she mine, see? Then we get a whole section. It's the same thing, but it's from the perspective of Denver. Beloved is my sister, she says. Then there's this passage here, which um, I talk about in the plot questions, the middle passage section. You should know what the middle passage is. Um, it refers to the transatlantic slave trade. And there's this slippage, this confusing bit where it's like beloved, the ghost is describing her time on a slave ship. So there's something about her as a ghost that connects her with the experiences of all the people snatched, kidnapped away from Africa, brought over to the now United States. Um, it's a very hard passage, hard part of the book. It's okay if you don't totally get it. I mean, I've read it a few times. It's still very hard to hard to read. Um, then this part, starting at page 253, these parts, parts of it are beloved narrating. I am beloved and she is mine. And parts are be beloved in dialogue with Seth and parts are just Seth. So if those parts feel confusing. That's because they are. But again, I bring you back to this part in the foreword that... This is, book is about being kidnapped, being thrown ruthlessly into an alien environment. And you have to keep asking yourself, why? Why does the author want to make the reader feel this way? And she tells us it's to create a shared experience. The characters were snatched from one place to another, from any place to any other, without preparation or defense. And this is enslavement and its legacy. So um, have courage. You know, this is very hard to get through. Follow along with the plot questions. There's a lot of resources online about this book, and it's difficult. It's it's one of the hardest books, but um, bits will start to make sense, and if you use the resources, things will make more sense. And if you're feeling confused and disoriented, then you're having the experience that Morrison intended. Um, so, and you can use that for analytical purposes, but also it's a good... It's a good um, artistic sort of rendition of the legacy of enslavement. All right, please email me if you have questions, and I hope you're doing well.